My business confession is so embarrassing. It's what I would refer to as a rookie mistake. This is a rookie error. Is this one about me? <laughs> <laughs> well, you have touched on this. I feel you? seen. <laughs> <laughs> if I was to do it all again, I don't know if I would be a public person, but I am. So let me just live with it. Hello and welcome back to the NatWest Business Show. I'm your host, Angelica Bell, and this season we've got more enterprising business owners with inspiring stories of startups, struggles and successes. And today's guest embodies this to a T. Sharma Dean Reed is a powerhouse. She's the founder of War Nails and more recently the Stack World, which looks to level the playing field with gender equity, particularly in the world of business. Sharma Dean's success is testament to her incredible hard work, determination and genuine passion, which has led her to become a widely revered person in business. If you want to build a business with purpose, get ready for an amazing chat. Sharmadine, welcome. Hi. How are you doing? I'm really well, thank you. Looking forward to hearing your story. But the first thing we ask our guests to do is to come with a confession. So maybe a moment of failure that helped shape you or a business blunder that you found invaluable. So spill the beans. My business confession is so embarrassing. It's actually what I would always refer to as a rookie rookie mistake this okay. is a rookie error so something you did at the start of your business. no 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 I did it not at the start of my business <laughs> but I would call it a rookie error okay. <laughs> or when I'm saying to my friends I'm like that's rookie behavior um which is we let the credit card expire on our domain for our main website so we had a website beautystack.com in our hosting you know it was renewing every year and then the credit card expired and nobody checked and then we lost the domain to a company abroad who was clearly had their eyes on it we were all like no what is happening and then they tried to sell it back to us for like a lot of money and I said no I said no because we were at a transition point of the business of switching from one company name to another. And I thought, okay, if I'm to look at the silver lining of this, maybe this is a sign. Maybe this is a sign to truly let go, mm. be zen about it. Whenever there is a problem or a blunder or a rookie mistake, as I call it, I try and look for the upside or the silver lining. And, you know, thankfully we were transitioning our business, but if I had not been, that would have been catastrophic. That a very, very been, expensive mistake. Yeah, exactly. So luckily you had sort of backup. Otherwise it could have been... Mm -mm. Definitely. I mean, anyone who is starting a business, you know, one of the first things you would want to do is trademark, IP, get your domain names, etc. But we also buy alternative domain names provided they're cheap. So not only the main company name, but maybe the .co.uk, .com, .london or whatever it is. Um, just a handful of alternatives to use as backup is always a good idea. So you've given some advice there <laughs> with your blunder. <laughs> Learning, advice. always learn exactly. from your mistakes. Sharma Dean, let's get down to the nitty gritty. Please tell us about War Nails and the stat world and how your businesses became what they are today. So I would say that I didn't ever set out to be an entrepreneur. I was 24 years old when I would love getting my nails done with my friends on the weekend. And I saw this particular nail design on a fashion show and it was a French tip and a half moon that were white and the nail was colored solid red. And I took that design to my no local nail salon and I said, can you do this for me? And they just did not want to do it. And this is 2008, 2007 or eight. And it frustrated me so much that as a customer, I would want something and I'd be willing to pay for it and pay extra. And the business was unwilling to do it. So then out of frustration, I remember my um, partner picked me up from the nail salon and I got into the car, slammed the door and I was like, I'm going to start my own nail salon. And it was literally as simple as that. <laughs> I just thought, why can't I? I can do this. But when you're young, you're naive. So you think you, can, you think you're invincible. I had also been traveling the world in my career as a consultant and seen incredible salon spaces in Asia and in California. We would come back to London and this is the era before flat whites, before um, social media, before 
majority of people had iPhones even. So the world was quite different then. And I thought, why don't I bring this type of concept to London? And then my brain started just developing the idea more and more. The way that I operate mentally is that when I have an idea, it's almost like a little cloud and starts to like, you know, get bigger Sands. and bigger and bigger until I see it through almost to completion. So it's like, I'm going to open a nail salon. It's going to be super cool. You can have anything you want on there. Anything you want on your nails, you're going to have it. And all my friends are going to come and it will be like a new community center and women will be able to hang out and chat. And we'll have one on every high street, which is when then I stop because I'm like, hang on a minute, let me just dial it back. So I had the idea then a shop came up on the high street, which was 30 seconds from my house in London. And again, full naivety, I just took it, took the lease on it and started painting the floor, painting the walls. Got one nails open six months later. During that six months, I was building up the reputation. Um, and yeah, when we got open, you know, 600 people came to that opening, which was crazy. But I did a really interesting thing. I painted the front of the shop bright pink. And I said, wah, nails coming soon. And I wrote magazines, books, nails, fashion. I didn't know that I was going to do any of these things. I just wrote it. So imagine a huge shop painted bright pink. That means that everyone who went past that shop on the number 55 bus, which was the coolest bus, because um, it took everyone to fashion school in central London, everyone would see it yeah. from the bus. And again, I, I wasn't being strategic in, in this method, but when I look back, I can see that that early willingness to tell people what I was working on before I'd finished it is what got the launch off the ground. You know, when you meet a friend and they say, oh, I'm working on something, but I can't tell you what it is. I think, well, that's a wasted opportunity for me to tell somebody else. Oh, did you meet and see Angelica the other day? She's working on this. It's going to be really exciting and getting buzz around. So, yeah, we had a lot of people in the opening and then we opened concessions in some department stores. And for 10 years, that space was a really incredible, innovative, game changing inspiring space for a lot of the women in the area hot pink marketing yeah I love that and it got the attention and built you I must have given you a lot of confidence especially when it was just an idea out of frustration I think that the younger I was the more confidence I had as in I don't remember not being confident actually as I've gotten older I've gotten less confident really yeah and I think that would probably be an ignorance is bliss mentality so you know I remember being three years old and being really confident at nursery school like loving my life feeling I could achieve and do anything and then slowly 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 the more that you know risk the more that you think about risk the more that you have responsibility so whether it's a family or a, or a home or you know, the more you think about how the system works and thinking, well, is the system pitted against me because I'm, you know, from Wolverhampton, I'm black, I'm a woman, you know, all of these things start then weighing and weighing on your on your mind. I would say that recognising the challenges that can come um, as you become more aware of your situation is quite an important thing to do but at the same time how do you not let it hold you back and that's what I think is really important when I was 24 I didn't know things like licenses council if I'd known a checklist of things that could potentially go wrong I might I might not have done it yeah. so I do think a healthy dose of naivety or ignorance or just having pure passion and um desire can at least give you that first bit of rocket fuel mm -hmm. with which to propel yourself forward, I would say. Well, obviously one is not enough mm. and you have gone on to gain more knowledge, which led to the stack world. So let's talk about that business. So I'd never really thought about gender equity as a concept before I moved to London um, started my degree, which I, I studied fashion. I had to make a magazine. So uh, during my degree, I made a hip hop magazine for girls called Wah, 
that's where the name originally yeah. came from. It was at that point I started to think about gender, specifically because I was still a teenager and going out partying. Um, the role of women in music and women in hip hop and what does misogyny look like in this world? And it was a way that I was expressing my curiosity about these big questions I had about the world. Through starting WA, I became connected with other women globally. So I made a printed magazine and I put it on a blog, you know, back in the day. And a lot of women all over the world would email me saying, can I have a copy? So I'd post them to Singapore, to LA. It was kind of crazy. I posted them everywhere. From there, I started to learn more about women's lives all over the world. And then through opening the salon, I got face-to-face -face contact with women, thousands and thousands of women over 10 years, every single day. When you are holding someone's hand while you're doing their nails and you're looking across from them and you have that FaceTime with a stranger for well over an hour, you start to pick up um, effectively data on what are the issues that women are facing today. One of the earliest issues I realized through being a business owner is around childcare. It never really occurred to me before that my employees wouldn't be able to work to their full potential because they didn't have enough childcare. And the balance of the cost of childcare with the cost of their earnings didn't make sense, you know, for them to work. Right. So this is when I started to understand and think about myself more, not just as a small business owner, but the responsibility I have to a, a macroeconomic environment and how the policies, the childcare policies that were, you know, being explored by the government at the time might not necessarily work down to someone who's sitting in front of me who wants to work more than 16 hours a week but can't because they're going to lose their benefits. Mm -hmm. So I'm starting to learn now more about my role as an entrepreneur of being a business owner and not just being someone who can do cool branding and do cool nails. Other things that came up were um, conversations about, you know, marriage or child you know, not just childcare, but when to have a child, for example. So I'm being an empath and a sponge and collecting all of this information. And one of the things that I felt was missing from women's communities or women's media was being able to talk about issues, um, you know, like I said, like uh, whether it's work or family, all these different issues in a way that wasn't just a tokenistic uh, feature next to fashion, beauty, and all of these different things that typically um, are in women's magazines. And then that's when I started to think about the stack world and what would a women's newspaper that initially I was thinking of a newspaper. I was like, what if I made a newspaper for women that actually had headlines that were kind of for women? So it was less about magazine journalism at the time and more about what would news look like if it, if it was women's news? And the reason for that is another thing I learned um, in my salon is a lot of women were in um, abusive relationships, for example, and the most unlikely women, which started to make me think, well, this could happen to anyone. So if it is happening to anyone, where's the news about it? Uh, so I started thinking about the stat world as a women's newspaper. However... I thought community is absolutely integral to a media organisation that relies on subscriptions and, you know, reader subscriptions, but they don't actually know anything about them. I was like, how can I get as close as possible, as close as I'm literally holding their hand in a nail salon? And the way that I do that is through community. So I built the community first. The Stack World launched March 2021 as a platform where women could join, attend events, um, network with each other. We launch with editorial stories such as, you know, what it's like to be stalked, you know, what would it be like to go to sex therapy? How do I pre prepare for a performance review? So this combination of self-development, like personal and professional development, we launch that. And then the community has now grown to 15,000 members in 32 countries. It's incredibly engaged. We have an amazing um, platform that people love and use. 
And now I'm thinking, how can I bring this into the workplace to effectively share the knowledge that I've got from my community with larger corporations who might have women in their ranks who are struggling with these issues but don't know where to turn or what to do. And that's that's what we are doing for some of our clients now. So your first business basically planted the seeds for your second one where you, in a, in a weird way, sort of in a really simple basic way you you had this sort of like you said this interaction with women but then with empathy like you say and also listening you could build up and find out what were the issues that were affecting women to to build on that which you want to grow even further so what lessons have you learned Charmadine from being a founder of multiple businesses this is a really important question and point because I from age 12 wanted to be a creative director or a publisher or the head of some media organization and it was only when I started my nail salon that my planned path started to go topsy-turvy started to go haywire you know 12 years old I used to be obsessed with newspapers and magazines um, and I was like this is the world I want to be in I became this accidental entrepreneur, as I say, and it made me constantly question, am I doing the right thing? Is this what my company's meant to be? Is this the path I want to be on? Do I even want to be a founder? Do I want to lead people or run a company? And I would say for the last 20 years, my journey has been, uh, you call it multiple businesses. I say it feels really random sometimes and that I'm starting things all the time. But what I would say is that there is a clear through line from when I was 19 all the way to today, which is telling women's stories and changing the perception of women in media or social media um, and helping other women see people like me and think well I could do it too mm. or I feel seen or I feel heard so for those who might be questioning am I on the right path I think that you can look at the past at what you've done before or what drove you or what you're most passionate about and you can plot this kind of trajectory of yourself and know that every single thing that you did helped you get to where you're going today. Because when I had the nail salon, there was no there was no concept that I was like, this is going to help me with the next thing. And I never thought that. I just was like going with the flow, you know. But now I'm like, yeah, this all makes sense. But it doesn't feel like it makes sense when you're in it. But then it's easy to say that with hindsight, isn't it? Because if you're at the start and you have a goal and you think this is where I want to be, if it's a bit undulating or whatever, it can be unsettling for some people. Definitely. And I would say that constant self-reflection of am I being inspired? Am I following my curiosities? Am I doing the things that make me feel in flow? Like yesterday, I did a piece of work and at the end of it, I told my friend, you know, that piece of work felt effortless because this is the thing I'm meant to be doing. This exact piece of work required no stress no you know no anxiety and it was a full day's work and if I can do more of this then I'm never having to work a day in my life so just regularly having check-ins I do it twice a year I check in with myself twice a year you know December January and then May June to look at what I'm interested in doing, what my passions are, what my purpose is, what my mission is, and being like, am I still on that right path? Because one of the things I would say for anyone who's building a business that's going really well, and that is getting loads of traction, is you have so many opportunities come to you. And I would say I said yes to everything. I was like, yes, I will fly to Tokyo and do a pop-up nail bar. Yes, we will do a nail polish line. Yes, we will do a clothing line. We did a big clothing line that sold like crazy. I literally said yes to everything when it came to war. And I didn't really consider, is this what I like doing? What I did do is treat it as a data gathering exercise. So I made a product line, you know, big product line in stores around the UK. And I was like, you know, I don't actually like making products. So then I stopped doing it. I was just like, I don't, I don't really like it. It's a cycle. Uh, it's a type of work I'm not that 
interested in doing. I did a clothing line, which I also loved creatively. But then I was like, mm, I'm not sure that this is for me either. So it's a constant push and pull of, am I doing what I like to be doing? What have I learned from this project? I'm not going to do it again if it doesn't work for me. I will do it again if it, if it works for me. Should we go on to trending takes? Now, our team have scoured the web um, for topics, tweets and talking points to potentially create some contentious statements that I want to put to you. Uh, and I want to hear your thoughts. So are you up for it? I love a contentious statement. I know you do. <laughs> yeah. OK, the first one I've got here. Unsolicited advice is the junk mail of life. My take on that is not all advice is equal. So this is an essay that I've written before, which is, I don't mind unsolicited advice. The next step for me is to pull apart that advice to understand the experience, background, biases, perspective of the person giving it. Mm. And then use that information to create a believability weighting on that advice. So... If you're giving me advice about presenting, that is a 10 out of 10 believability weighting, <laughs> right? But then if you're giving me advice about a solo trip around the world I want to take, but you don't have a passport yourself, the believability weighting is one or two. So I think it pays to be open to taking advice because there's nothing worse than, you know, someone who's very defensive and doesn't want to listen. But I think that... It's your responsibility to pull apart that advice and understand where that person is coming from and then decide, am I going to, you know, they've used the term junk mail. Am I going to rip this up and throw it out or am I going to put this in the filing cabinet of information? Love that. In business, learning is more powerful than earning. Oh, classic. Is this is this one about me? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you have touched on this. I feel you? seen. <laughs> <laughs> We've exposed you. You have exposed me because one of the things that I've written in my guide to working with me, which is a manual on how I operate that anyone can read publicly, is I fantasize about doing degrees all the time. If I had nothing to do, I would do a degree over and over and over again. But degrees don't pay money right now when mm. you're, a, you know business owner with a family so I would say that this is an infinite loop which is you have to keep learning and be an infinite learner otherwise it's going to have an impact on your earnings but then if you don't make earnings you don't have the cushion to enable you to learn so what I mean by that is you know when you have uh, excess profit or excess disposable income that is the time when you have a choice to say you know, I'm going to take a week off work because I really want to do a training course. I really want to do an MBA or I want to upskill myself in this um, piece of information that I know is going to propel my business forward. I definitely take time for learning several times a year. I will go on conferences, retreats, networking with other founders, because that is how you get some outside perspective to bring back into your business but I wouldn't say one is more priority over the other for me and if I was to truly say what's in my heart it would be 60% learning 40% earning <laughs> <laughs> and you did say that sometimes you take decisions or you take your business to places where not it's not about the earning it's about what makes you feel fulfilled well on that note we're going to wrap up trending takes thank you so much for your thoughts and if you're watching this podcast on YouTube, we would love to know what you think in the comments. Get typing. You mentioned that you were raising a little one at the same time as starting out your businesses. How did you balance that, you know, business life with your personal life? Was it challenging or like you said, you had to-do lists, you were quite organised, you know, how was it at that time? A lot of the times Roman would come with me. I was way more organized in those early years of uh, his life than I have ever been ever I would wake up d d d like here's what we're going to do for the day and I scheduled my meetings around his nap times I would take him with me to meetings in a little sling and just schedule them for when I knew he was going to sleep 
So trying to be flexible and having compassion for yourself as well and knowing that um, we are raising children in unusual times, which is, a dis you know, the family is dispersed in a way it hasn't been before. So just give yourself a break. And also maybe to be assertive in what you want and be like, my baby's coming with me or this is how it is. But I still want to work and I'm still, you know, a person that you need to uh, take seriously. Do you know what I did? I just made it seem completely normal. I didn't request or assert anything. Really? Okay. I just brought him with me and that was that. <laughs> like I just didn't, I didn't even um, make a big deal about it. But like I said, he was a very good baby. So like I'd walk to my meetings and I'd bounce him and then he'd be asleep and I'd walk through the door asleep and I'd know I've got 45 clear minutes. Yeah. And then the minute he would wake up and start stirring, I would wrap up the meeting. And it just made you more efficient. And I think any working parent can understand that there becomes an efficiency obsession. Um, the times when I always got it wrong was when I tried to do two things, when I tried to be a mom and have my head in work. And I just felt like my brain couldn't do both at the same time. And actually I just disappointed everybody. Mm. So understanding that there was a period between two and five when I really had to separate the two things. Prior to two, it was okay. Um, but there were many times when I was like, okay, not good um, behavior that I've done right now. And I'd have to re reflect and be like, no, I'm going to do this with my son. And then I'm gonna have my um, work time and then I'm going to do my work and just creating real uh, division between yeah. them. Yeah, boundaries, setting boundaries mm. for yourself. Now, you have talked about mentoring, being mentored and mentoring yourself. First, I wanted to say how important is having a mentor when you are setting up a business? I think it's important to be able to look at these people in your life as another point of view or another perspective on the problem rather than thinking of someone who's just telling you what you want to hear or helping you go um, wherever you want to go they're not just you know a stepping stone they are a point of view so having that diversity of thought is really really important and when you're selecting mentors it can be it can be easy to think I need someone who's been in my industry. So, for example, if you're in beauty, I need someone who's in beauty. If you're in food, I need someone who's in food. And there is definitely plus points to that. But I think also having someone who was adjacent to that industry can, again, illuminate your perspective on what you're doing in your business. So, you know, I just spoke to one of my mentors, although he wouldn't know he was a mentor, this morning. And he gave me a completely different point of view on a problem that I've gotten at work. So that is so invaluable because what you don't want to be is in an echo chamber. You don't want to be in a place where everything you think is just reflected back at you with yes people. You want people to be able to challenge your thinking and be like, have you looked at the problem from this angle? And as a mentor, what's been your proudest moment then? Oh, there are so many because the way that I mentor is in is fairly informal. I will continue doing what I'm doing, whether it affects people or not. You know, I do it because I think it should be done and I think it should happen. And if I get too concerned with, let me write this book because it's going to change people's lives, yeah. <laughs> then I'm setting myself up for potential disappointment, you know, uh, failure, um, the pressure. And I just can't let my happiness and my mental stability rely on other people's expectations of my output. It can't be that way. So when people come up to me and say, you changed my life, I'm like, I'm so happy. Yeah. But then I've turned a corner and I've stopped thinking about it. So that's the way you cope with it, being public facing. You do things for yourself. And as long as you're happy, you know, it's part of that process. Like you said, you try something, it doesn't work. That's it. Put it to one side. And that means you, you're sustainable. And I guess that's helped you become successful or more successful because you've taken the time to learn about yourself to help your business. 
Yeah, I would actually say that, well, I wouldn't say I was successful. <laughs> But that's interesting because I've got yet. no come on. <laughs> it's all about um optics though, isn't it? What people think. What I would say I've been successful at is being resilient, moving forward, not having big lulls in my work where I was confused or didn't know where I was going. Um but what I would say is my personality type has definitely meant that I've taken a winding and a bit slower journey than most and the reason I say that is because there are so many different types of business owners and entrepreneurs and one example is introverts I feel like introverts feel I can't run a business because I'm introverted or I'm shy or I don't have the confidence to get up and speak in public to my employees but I just think that's not true and I think that in this era that we live in Everyone can have the opportunity to have a go. And if we continue to box the vision of an entrepreneur in this very narrow field, we're not going to see the full potential of what we could be as a, as a you know, country, as a world, if we continue to make people think, mm, it's not quite for me. So when I say my personality, what that means is creative. You know, I went to art school. I'm not like someone who did an MBA and then started a business. I'm way more creative. I'm way more mission driven. I'm way more socially impact driven um, than other business leaders that I know. And it just means when I mention that integrity of doing the right thing, I've often done the right thing to my detriment, but it makes me sleep well at night. So I think that how I view success is going back to what I said before is am I doing the thing that really drives me forward and then can I make it into a commercially successful business well you've given us some advice that you've received but I wanted to ask you about the most important piece of advice you've ever got get out of the weeds that was a piece of advice that I hated (laughs) at the time I thought it was so mean because I was the type of person, and I'm sure many business owners can relate, if I walk past a broken thing on the floor, I would go and fix it. If I, you know, if something needed to be done in the kitchen, I would go and do it. And I remember this guy saying to me, you need to get out of the weeds. If you're the CEO, you can't be every minute, you know, trying to solve every single problem that's happening. You need to be able to delegate. You need to be able to think bigger, think macro. And you need to get out of the weeds, love. That's what you said. <laughs> and I was like, Ugh. but, you know, they were right. And Have you done it? I've done it. I still love detail and I still will do the things that I love to do. I was joking with another um, female founder friend who says, yeah, she won't let go of the social media account because she just loves doing it. And that's what I would call like being in the weeds. But then we joke that there's some things we do, not because we have to, but because we love doing it. And I guess it keeps us a bit grounded and, you know, close to our user. So get out of the weeds. Right. Shall we do some rapid fire questions? The rapid fire. I know. I'm so hard at these because I love to chat. You do love to chat. (laughs) I'm going to try. But it's all in the title. Yeah. Who is your business inspiration? Oprah Winfrey. Really? Why? This blend of being the talent and the CEO is difficult. Not many people have achieved it. I think that, you know, people like Michael Bloomberg, Martha Stewart, it's not easy to do, to create a huge business, but also be the front of it I would prefer to not be the front of my business but I feel that I'm in that trap now you said it was rapid fire and you asked but me. I gave you <laughs> no, I was literally gonna say I gave you the so I gave you the scope you know, to expand you know what I mean yeah, in yeah. like if I was to do it all again I don't know if I would be a public person but I am so let me just live with it but I always want to run a business I don't want to be a talent you know what I mean just Understood. forever what advice would you give your younger self It's okay, babes. Move on. What do you most enjoy about owning and running the stack world? Every single day, 
women messaging me with a story of how we've had an impact on them. One thing nobody is talking about in business that they should be. Why do we have benefits around gym, laundry, all of this, but no childcare on site of offices? One tip on how to stay motivated during tough times. Like Simba heard, remember who you are. What's your favourite part of being an entrepreneur? Meeting people like you. Oh, you can come back. Where can people follow you online to know more about you and your business? The stack.world is where I live. Thank you so much for taking part today and being with Thanks us. Thanks for having it's me. It's been so insightful. And thank you to those listening. Remember to hit follow and subscribe so you know when the latest episodes drops with more inspiring stories from incredible guests. And as always, if today's episode has got you thinking about a potential career shift into business, head over to the DatWest website for tools and information that help you take those next steps to success. <laughs>